I'll tell you a bit about what the event is about and how it's going to work and then we'll get started. So um, my name is Jo Fletcher Cross, I'm an Associate Editor here at National Geographic Traveller and uh, I am going to be leading the panel through a series of questions. We've got an incredible panel here tonight with a real wealth of experience so I think it's going to be a really interesting and exciting one. So um, I'll introduce you to the panel in a moment but I want to explain how things are going to work. So there are two ways that you can communicate with us this evening. We have a chat function, as you've probably experienced on Zoom before. You can chat to other people in the audience. Please tell us where you're from, chat amongst yourselves. You know, it's, uh, we're really excited that we've got people here from all over the world, so it's lovely to see where you're joining us from. There's also the Q&A function, and you can use the Q&A function to direct questions to us that we can ask the panel. So how it will work this evening is we will be chatting. I've got lots and lots of questions for the panel as I'm sure you can imagine and um, we'll be chatting for about 40 to 45 minutes and then I'll open it up to questions from you so please do send us your questions uh, through the Q&A function not the chat function just so we can gather them all in one place we'll ask as many questions as we possibly can I suspect there's an, a lot of people registered for the event tonight so I suspect we're not going to be able to get to all of them but we'll try and get to as many as we can um, so uh, let's get started let me introduce you to our incredible panel. Um, I'd like to start by introducing you to Hitomi Hosono. Hitomi is a ceramicist, um, a world-renowned ceramicist, I should say. Uh, Hitomi was born in Gifu Prefecture in Japan, obviously. She studied the Kutani ceramic tradition in Kanazawa in Ishikawa Prefecture before continuing her artistic training in Copenhagen and London. She's known for intricately carved and botanically inspired ceramic pieces which look to the aesthetic traditions of both Japan and Europe. In 2018 she was chosen to be the first ever artist in residence at Wedgwood. Her pieces can be found in the permanent collections of the British Museum and the V&A and also if you look on the Japan House website you can also explore her work there. Uh, we've also got tonight uh, Matthew Johnson, who is the Marketing and Communications Manager at the Japanese National Tourism Organization. He is uh, passionate about Japan and started learning the language and he says inhaling the pop culture in his early teens. He's lived and studied in Tokyo and travelled the country from top to bottom and will tell anyone who will listen about the diverse wonders of off the beaten track Japan. So we've certainly got plenty of people listening tonight, Matt, so I've got lots of questions for you. Uh, we've also got Simon Wright joining us this evening and he is Director of Programming at Japan House. He's got more than 30 years of experience of either working in or with Japan. He heads up the programming team at Japan House London and he's been with the Japan House project from the very beginning. And he's passionate about activities which evolve through co-creation and co-production and works closely with a wide variety of artists and content holders in Japan on a daily basis and is extremely knowledgeable about the subjects we're going to be talking about tonight. So I'm very very excited to ask him lots of questions. And finally, we've got Pico Iyar, who is the author of more than a dozen books, including A Beginner's Guide to Japan and Autumn Light. He regularly contributes to the New York Review of Books, Granta and the Financial Times, and dozens and dozens of magazines around the world. I'm sure you all know his writing. Uh, his three recent TED Talks have received seven million views so far. So hopefully some of those people are also tuning in to see us this evening. So let's get started. I'm going to ask uh, questions to the panel. I'll direct questions to people in Individually, but I'll also open out questions if the panel want to leap in and provide an answer please please feel free to do so. Um, my first question I'm going to start by directing this to Simon if you don't mind and I want to ask you how you think people perceive craft making in Japan. So the title of tonight's talk is uh, Made in Japan and we're looking at craft and, and you know just starting planning a trip to Japan and looking at Japan from the culture, from looking at culture. There's a vast wealth of craft, as you will know, employing an astonishing array of techniques and technologies. So it's a fascinating way to start seeing the country. How do you think people perceive craft in Japan? Craft um, is quite a loaded word, isn't it? And I think within, within Japan, of course, you will have um, an idea of korge as well, which is this, 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 this high craft. I, I prefer to look at the idea of craft as more of making, uh, and, and that it's the skill of making and, and, and that therefore not necessarily uh, an intricately woven vine basket, which would very much sit within the craft idea, I think, with many people's mind, 
but also manufacturing within small industry bases in places such as Subame Sanjo in Niigata Prefecture, where a, a huge community is devoted to, to metalworking. And I, I think all of them are, are craft. Small watchmakers in, 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 in Tokyo is also craft. In your experience, Simon, are, are visitors to Japan House interested in experiencing craft within Japan? Within Japan? Yes. Um, so, um, yes, indeed. I think they look, they, their first port of call can be Japan House. It may be their first uh, experience of, of, of craft work, skill, made things, beautifully made things. Uh, monozukuri, if you were, maybe, and a Japanese term which some people may be familiar with, uh, this idea of craftsmanship. Uh, yes, indeed. And it does inspire, I think, people to to go to Japan as well as a result. We, we always try to put stories behind each piece that is either sold in the shop, or if we do an exhibition, for example, we've done an exhibition devoted to, I mentioned metalwork briefly, we've done an exhibition devoted entirely to metalwork, and I'm looking to doing an exhibition devoted entirely to woodworking from the Hida region of Gifu Prefecture. Marvellous, thank you so much. And I should mention that, Simon, you are actually in Japan House at the moment, aren't you? That's what we can see behind you. This is a real background, yes. This is Under a real background. Several of us have uh, fake backgrounds. Um, I am not actually in a beautiful Japanese garden. Um, Pico, that is Pico's uh, real background. Um, Tomi and Matt are also um, in, in Japan House, as it were. Um, do you forgive us if we move around too much and get excited, we'll probably disappear into the background. So please forgive us if that happens. But uh, Simon, you definitely won't disappear because you are in a real place. <laughs> exciting. Um, thank you. I wonder if I could ask, um, Matt, I'm going to ask you a question next, something that's a little more broad perhaps. So where do people start if you want to set up a trip to Japan? Uh, how do you begin to research a trip that incorporates culture, craft? You know, where, where do you begin? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I think, I, I guess it will vary from person to person. Um, but I would say that certainly some of the major ports of call for, for people looking to sort of deepen their knowledge or get some inspiration um, can certainly be, not to do a shameless self-plug, the JNTO website, um, japan.travel, um, or if you type in JNTO UK, it'll get you there. Um, we have, we've recently renovated the whole, the whole website, and so it's full of information that you can search by tradition, by crafts, and also by region. Um, if you're looking to, to get some specific inspiration. Um, but as um, Simon said, Japan House is obviously um, very active in this space, specifically around craft um, and design. And they have a lot of fantastic exhibitions. So if you're ever in London or even, you know, now, I know that um, you guys over at Japan House have, um, have transitioned to a, sort of a more virtual model as well to allow people um, to participate in sort of craft activities or craft related activities from home. Um, so um, I'd say that yeah, we're definitely two two big ports of call and um, start with. Um, but you know, I mean, above and beyond that, um, there are lots of tour operators that operate in this space as well, um, and travel agents as well, specialised tours. Um, so I know that, um, for example, Japan Journeys have a specific ceramics tour, um, and a lot of the more bespoke agents as well um, will be you know, um, very familiar with this space as well and be able to recommend clients on a face-to-face -face kind of basis, depending on what their, um, what their needs and interests are. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there's a, a couple of different ones, but I would say those are probably the, the biggest three. Fabulous, thank you so much, Matt. Um, I would like to ask, let's, let's talk a bit more about craft and culture. Um, and we've got such a, an incredible breadth of knowledge on this panel, I don't quite know where to start, but let's go for Hitomi, if that's okay. Um, Hitomi, I'd like to ask you, what, where, where would you recommend, where would you go to see um, the crafts that you're particularly interested in or involved in, in Japan? Of course, I'm a ceramic artist, so I, it's not because of my field, I'm not uh, really pressing, but the pottery actually, very good to understand the Japanese craft because uh, the, there are so many kirimu sites all over Japan and each region have a, a distinct style and then you can actually see the uh, their the people uh, the, through the pottery and uh, what kind of people live there.
the what kind of history they had. So I pretty much recommend to visit the, a lot of uh, different kilm sites in Japan. Uh, uh, it's been said uh, uh, usually like uh, six kiln sites in the main, but there are actually more than that. And the, uh, the Gifu prefecture where I was born wasn't included in this uh, uh, six kiln sites, but actually pro uh, have been producing the, most of the uh, tiles used in all over Japan. And the, so uh, it has a, such a richness uh, in the, uh, to understand the region if you look at their pottery. So I really recommend people to look at the pottery in Japan. Okay. Thank you so much, Usomi. Um, Pico, could I open the question to you? I, you are in California at the moment, I understand, is that correct? <laughs> yes, longing to be in Japan. In Japan, <laughs> my heart and imagination, but in body in California. Yeah, and you, you <laughs> normally live in Japan, is that right? That's correct, for 32 years. And I'm very prejudiced because all 32 years I've been living around the ancient capitals of Kyoto and Nara. So I would say anybody interested in all the crafts maybe should start in Kyoto. And when my friends are coming, I often suggest they come for two weeks. I tell them only to spend two days in Tokyo. It's a fascinating modern city, but they've probably been to Shanghai or New York or Hong Kong already. And then to base themselves for maybe six days in, in Kyoto, where they will be able to steep themselves in every possible um, craft dating back to the 8th century. And then um, I often recommend they spend a couple of days in Koyasan, this mountain uh, filled with temples where they'll really get a taste of 9th century Japan, the ancient. And then perhaps to go um, to Naoshima, a complex of art museums in the Inland Sea, quite difficult to get to, extremely cutting edge, very contemporary on the surface, and deeply 8th century um, at its heart. And I suppose generally, to um, <clears throat> come off what Hitomi-san was saying, I recommend anybody to go and stay in a ryokan, a Japanese uh, traditional inn, because every vase, every meal, every kimono, every detail there is introducing you, opening the door to a different aspect uh, of Japanese crafts and, and culture. If you go to a classic ryokan in Kyoto, um, the one I'm thinking of, no, only 19 rooms, no front desk, no lobby, no health club, no um, swimming pool. It's almost an alchemy of absences, all the things that you don't have um, that you would expect in any uh, Western hotel. But when you have your dinner in autumn, you're going to eat ginkgo berries uh, served on autumn leaves. Every nuance of the kimono that the maids are wearing has to do with autumn and the interplay of beauty and, and impermanence. And so the wonder of going to a ryokan is sometimes you never even want to go out to visit the city around you because just walking along the tatami corridors, taking a bath, looking out on the garden, you're getting an immersion crash course in every detail of classical Japan. How wonderful, thank you so much. An alchemy of absence sounds like what we've all been, um, <laughs> we're all in an moment, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. That sounds wonderful. I'm desperate to go somewhere. That'll do. <laughs> um, Simon, can I open it up to you, please? Where would you, where would you recommend? Where would you go to see the crafts that you're particularly interested in? Um, well, of course, Pico said Kyoto. Uh, <laughs> wherever one goes in in Japan, one always says, mm, "But there are also people who make it in Kyoto. Maybe you should go there and see." Uh, um, this strong tradition of the of the ancient capitals, of course. Um, I mean, I would say Kagoshima, of course, <laughs> in, 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 um, which is my, my, my particular uh, part of Japan, I suppose. Uh, in, in Kagoshima, there is a strong tradition of first European contact in the early part or mid-early part of the 19th century, uh, ahead of the uh, major restoration and many of the heroes of the revolution which, which transformed Japan in the mid 19th century came from Kagoshima. And so there's a lot of interplay between uh, industrial technology and, and craftsmanship. And one example what might be, for example, Satsuma Kiriko, which is a form of cut glassware, very colorful cut glassware, can seem a bit gaudy, but the more, the more, the more you look into it, the more the more beautiful it becomes and it needs to be appreciated i think in its japanese context 
to be to appreciate it to its full. But I like that interplay between cultures, uh, between peoples, uh, and between times. And Kagoshima is a, a great example of that, I think. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, Matt, what would you suggest? If it, what the crafts are you particularly interested in and would, would go and see in Japan? Yeah, I think um, it's sort of similar to, to what Simon was saying, also you were speaking about um, Kagoshima um, and kind of the interplay between um, industrial sort of um, manufacturing um, and also traditional sort of methods of craftsmanship. And I think one area that I sort of associate with that um, very strongly as well is the Aizu region um, of Fukushima Prefecture, which is just north of Tokyo, about an hour or two on the bullet train. Um, and it's kind of, it's a real, it's very remote, um, very mountainous, incredibly beautiful, um, has very, um, well, the whole of Japan does to a certain degree, but has very sort of clear cut seasons as well, um, which really kind of accentuates the natural landscape, which sort of surrounds all this craftsmanship. Um, but there's a beautiful scenic railway line there um, called the, T the Tadami line, um, which crosses through um, valleys and goes over bridges um, and through all these tiny little villages, um, which um, have incredible cross um, heritage there, um, specifically around things like basket weaving, which, um, which I mentioned already, um, and sort of using natural resources, so the mountain vines and um, any other specific regional um, flora and to, to create these, these amazing masterpieces um, in these sort of tiny villages um, of, I think it was probably about a thousand people. There is one village, Mishima, I think, which was voted Japan's most beautiful village, um, I think a couple of years ago. Um, and I think the statistic is something like 10% of the population is a craftsman. Um, and I think that kind of says it all. Um, and, you know, there's a wealth of other things to do there from, from black aware, um, there's Aizu Momen textiles, um, which is a, typ a particular type of um, cotton um, and a typical type of designing of the cotton as well. So using sort of vertical stripes and each region within that region has their own stripes. Um, so there's a whole lot of sort of cultural um, phenomenon kind of imbued there as well and kind of um, the region's history, long winters, very difficult to produce um, agriculture during that time. What other sort of things can you produce during that time? Um, and those kind of, I guess, craft having arisen out of necessity as well. So I, I really like the way that that region is so condensed with so many um, different crafts, um, but also is so um, representative of that link between um, culture and craft and lifestyle. Interesting that you mentioned Aizu, actually, because Aizu and Satsuma in Kagoshima were diametrically opposed to each other during the Meiji Restoration. <laughs> <laughs> no offence, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, I feel like Simon could say a lot about that. I've got a few <laughs> <laughs> Simon, I was going to open up a question to you next, and I, we've spoken about tradition in, in the past. Um, could we talk about crafts and the perception of tradition? What would you consider tradition and what would you consider modern craft? Is there a difference between them? I thought you were going to say the word traditional. I was trying very hard not to. <laughs> For those who know me, um, I, I, I always try and Japan House too tries to avoid using the word traditional simply because it, it tends to, to, to make people think of the past or something which is maybe irrelevant to the present. And so by using the word tradition alone, it, it, it creates, it forces you in a way to speak in that puts it in the present and also therefore the future. A tradition is something that's continuous. A tradition is something that changes. Um, it's not something that needs to be static and preserved in the past. And so the idea of crafts being traditional is a difficult concept for me to 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 to, to, to say and, and craft is part of a tradition it brings something from the past it brings it through the, the present and into the future so not knife making in 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 Subame Sanjo for example um, obviously there was a different form of knife making before but they still make knives in, in Subame Sanjo and they will continue to make knives in, in Subame Sanjo but these differences of, of technique and, and manufacture may change. And, and in Subameshi, 
uh, in, in Tsubamizanjo. They are known for their polishing techniques. These polishing techniques were originally from Kiseru, the, the, the pipes used by, by Edo period gentlemen, and they were highly polished. And it was one of the things that, that Edo gentlemen were allowed to, to, to own when they weren't allowed to earn very much, earn, own very much. And this highly skilled polishing technique has been transferred into contemporary society that we have now for polishing, I think I can say it quickly, the backs of iPhones, for example, iPods, and, and this, very, this very highly polished uh, technique is, is something that's been very localized in Japan in a particular area. So all of its craft, I think. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Simon. Hitomi, how, how does this feed into your practice? You, your work fuses, you know, techniques which, which come from long ago with contemporary ideas. What, would you say that's true? What, what, how does it work with your practice and looking back at the past of Japan? Hitomi, can you hear us? I'll come back to Hitomi. <laughs> we'll come back to Hitomi in a little bit. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the question that uh, I couldn't hear the quality. Uh, could you please uh, repeat that again? Of course, yes. So, how does looking back at the past of Japan and the tradition of crafts uh, feed into your practice now as a contemporary ceramicist? Yes, very much. It's uh, the traditional, uh, the, for example, Kutani pottery, that the technique inspired me. But the, I don't, for example, take over the style that they used to use a lot. Uh, so um, I kind of the looking for the thing that the people now living interested in and they also uh, um, but at the same time, I don't deny this traditional technique because there are so many other elements in the uh, process that we, I can take it and expand it, use it for my work. And actually, it really helps to develop my own work. Uh, so um, I, I build pretty much uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the treasure, this uh, traditional technique. and. Uh, Sometimes style also, uh, there is some, uh, when I go to the museum, there is uh, lots of uh, <coughs> some elements I can expand to make contemporary work. So uh, we can, we can, uh, the st we should still looking at it, I think, uh, to create new things. Thank you so much, Utomi. That's really, really wonderful. Thank you. Um, Pico, I wonder if I could ask you a, a related question. Um, as someone who is a, a creator, a creative, do you find that uh, your surroundings in Japan inspire you? Yes, I think they teach me exactly what I hadn't learned growing up in England and the US. In other words, silence, spaciousness, and the fewer things there are in the room, the deeper is the attention you can bring to any, any of them and the more charged they become. Of course, in a classical Japanese tatami room, there may be simply a scroll and a vase. Because there's nothing else there, you bring all of yourself to those and you find the universe and beyond in them. And I, I loved what Simon was saying about how everything is craft there. And as he was talking about tradition, I was thinking how uh, somebody called Richard Florida in the University of Toronto surveyed 45 countries, major developed countries of the world. And number one in terms of closeness to tradition was Japan. Even though I think when many people get off the plane in Narita airport, what hits them first is how much is Western and modern and zany. And I think Japan is extremely contemporary in its surfaces and extremely ancient in its depths. And I sometimes think of it as an old man in a Planet Hollywood t-shirt. So very up to the second, very cool, very global, but no less Japanese and no less old for the, the styles he happens to be fashioning. And actually to speak to um, the notion that craft is everywhere, it sounds facetious, but it's not that I often tell my friends, if you're going to Japan, go to a convenience store. And everything we associate with craft has to do with attentions, 
patience and care about detail. And in the simplest, most everyday transaction in Japan, that's exactly what you see. And I think in many cultures that I visited, there's a great disjunction between what you see in the old city or in the museums and what you see in the streets. But if you look beneath the surface, I think there's an extraordinary continuity in, in Japan. And just the way you buy uh, somebody wraps uh, your Kit Kat and hands it over to you in the convenience store, has as much care as somebody making a beautiful pot down, down the street. So it's hard to go anywhere in Japan and not be moved and perhaps humbled by attention to detail and to some extent the respect for traditions that have been going on a long, long time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rico. Um, my next question is, I, th I think probably for Simon, for Matt, but obviously anyone can join in. Um, if you want to go to Japan and experience some of these crafts for yourself to actually take part, to try and, you know, try those techniques, is that possible to do? Is that easy? Uh, Matt, please, your, 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 <laughs> your, your, your Japan National Tourism Organization. <laughs> I, mean, I, I could talk about but uh, please. Um, yes, I, am, I mean, yes is, is, the, is the short answer. Um, yeah, there's, there's a wealth of, of experiences on offer there. Um, and, you know, a lot of them, as I say, are very well represented on, on the tourism map and within the kind of the tour operator sort of realm. And again, on our website, <laughs> sorry to say it again, but, um, but, you know, they are collated there. Um, and I think, you know, more than anything, there's, there's generally, even if you're not making the craft yourself or involved, you know, in some kind of manufactured experience to, to make it alongside someone, um, the general reception that we always have in terms of people coming and visiting workshops or being allowed to spaces or seeing, um, you know, artwork or, or whatever it is, is generally one of, you know, a, a warm welcome. So um, there's a great sort of, um, I think sense of people wanting to share their crafts and and share kind of what drives them especially to someone from from a different country who's who's interested um so so yeah i would say that it's definitely out there i think one of the things you do have to be careful of obviously sometimes depends how regional regional you go um is uh things like language barrier you might want to um have a guide or indeed you know there are volunteer guide associations a lot of the time um by which you pay for sort of expenses, um, but a local sort of English fan, so you know, you're often um, a retiree with who's been studying English through their life, um, looking to host people, or, you know, welcome people to their city, will be able to help you out. And again, there's lists of those online and on our website too. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's there's a real wealth and there's a real diversity within Japan in terms of those crafts. Um, each region has something to offer. Um, in its own different way that's quite unique and reflective of the landscape and, and the culture. Um, and, and yeah, I think um, generally speaking, very open and definitely I think in the, in the past couple of years, a real um, boom in kind of people being able to offer that in a kind of more mm, slick kind of way, I guess, um, in a kind of more traditional tourism package that you might, um, you might think of. Thank you. Well, Simon, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Well, yes, I think maybe picking up on something that Matt said there. I mean, each region has it has particular styles as well. Of, of style, I say styles, particular um, special specialities. Pico mentioned Kyoto, of course, where I think everything is there, isn't it? In Kyoto, you've got this amazing um, opportunity to, to to see metal workers, to see to to see to to see ceramicists, to to see woodworkers, to see to see the whole gamut of, of craftsmanship. If you go to, I suppose where Hitomi was talking about. Uh, you were talking about Ishikawa and Kutani. So that there's a strong uh, tradition of, of ceramics using gold. Um, if you go to somewhere like Tsubame Sanjo, I'll mention that again in Niigata, simply because of their metalworking tradition there. They have in the last, within the last 10 years, created a, a weekend of open factories and crafts uh, workshops where for one weekend at the very beginning of October, you can go into the various factories, the various workshops, and in some of them actually create spoons or, 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 or make, make, a, make a nail. Or, and this, I think, is an increasing experiential form of tourism, which is, is taking hold throughout Japan. 
a, a lot of it has got to do with a lot of these small industries, I think, being in all corners of Japan and, and the need and the desire to, to warmly welcome people into those regions, into those areas, and giving people something that they can look forward to and, and, and fulfill themselves with their visit with while they're there. I think it's, Sorry, go ahead. It's, it's probably interesting to add there as well, but I think for a long time, you know, it's not necessarily just um, in terms of sort of international tourism into Japan, um, but very much within the domestic tourism market as well. Um, Japanese people travel for these things as well. Um, and so the infrastructure and certainly the demand has been there for, for a certain amount of time, which I think has helped also prop up these industries. Um, and I think that's quite reassuring, I guess, in some ways, because obviously it does mean that those experiences are out there and they are accessible and, and um, open to, to visitation. Thank you. There's a picture of <laughs> Madame Santo <laughs> of, the open, of the open factory itself. So it's an idea of how branding has, has, has taken over. Sorry, Pico, I interrupted. No, nothing important, but just as Matt was saying, Kyoto is sometimes described as the most visited city in the world outside of Mecca. 55 million visitors every year. And what people often forget is that 40 million of them are, as Matt was saying, domestic tourists. So, so many Japanese people going every year to Kyoto almost as pilgrims to go to the, the cradle of their culture. And it's rather inspiring to visit a country where people are so proud of and excited about their own tradition and crafts. Wonderful, thank you. Um, wonderful, lovely answers. Thank you so much. Um, Hitomi, I have another question for you. And uh, Hitomi, sorry. And then I'd like to open it up in a similar vein to everyone. You obviously are a ceramicist. What drew you to ceramics? And, and what about um, Japanese ceramics do you think is particularly attractive, unique? So the different, uh, like I said before, different region have a uh, different style and the history of ceramics. So the, um, so in a way, the I grew up in the, this Mino region where the Minoyaki is the, the home of Minoyaki and my grandfather, the tile workers, the applied tiles on the house, and then the. Uh, I was looking at it, there's so much possibilities in this material, I thought. So that's why first I went into the ceramics. Uh, but then I moved to Kanazawa to learn another uh, style of ceramics. So I kind of saw the, uh, the by learning different style and technique of ceramics, uh, I can enrich my own work, I thought. So that's why I, I thought that the ceramics uh, is the best uh, the kind of field for me, I thought. Lovely, thank you. And what do you think, uh, why are Japanese ceramics distinct? Are they, are they particularly unique? Um, I think that the, each country have a unique ceramics, but uh, in Japan, it's like the, uh, everywhere. And the, the, it's in a daily life, and uh, also the people. When when I talk uh, with the people in Japan making something and having hobby, always they talk about the ceramics. And when I question why you like it, and they, because they can make anything shape they like, and also they like the idea of using the work they make. So that's why I think they're quite uh, the, uh, attract a lot of people. So uh, because of it, the people's passion so much into the ceramics. So there are a lot of uh, um, collectors and also the craft uh, uh, pottery, pottery uh, potters and uh, the painters on the ceramics. That, and the, each kind of process uh, developed more and more. So the, I think that the each process is so much, uh, the, in a way, uh, the refined, I think, in Japan. And that's why I think uh, the ceramics is quite uh, the, uh, uh, the unique compared to the other uh, pottery in the world, I think. Lovely. Thank you so much, Tommy. That's wonderful. Um, Pico, could I ask you, what draws you to Japan and what draws you to Japanese crafts? 
what draws me to Japan is probably kindness, attention, and grace. And I think as a foreigner, one really gets spoiled. Um, Simon and Matt were talking about how, in my experience, many of the experience, people are shy about speaking English there, but they're extraordinarily good at communication and extremely welcoming. And over the years, sometimes I've met people who are scared of going to Japan because they worry it'll be expensive or they worry about the language barrier. And when they go there, they'll often say, you know, I met somebody who could barely speak English and she went three hours out of her way to make sure I was safely back at my hotel or, or whatever. Um, so in, in the many countries I've visited, I've never found that degree of hospitality quite um, anywhere else. And when we're talking about craft, I've also been thinking about how um, last year I brought out a little book called Autumn Light, which is really a tribute to the Japanese filmmaker Yasujiro Ozu from the 1950s. And for anyone who's interested in Japanese aesthetics, simply watching an Ozu film, Tokyo Story or Late Spring, it's a wonderful initiation into a wholly different way of making art and, and approaching the world because it's very quiet, almost nothing happens in the space of two and a half hours. Uh, it's very still. The camera in an Ozu movie never moves. It's always at the Tami level. So it's looking respectfully at everything around. And um, one of the glories of those movies is one of the glories of Japan, which is, as I say, it seems that nothing is happening. A, a daughter will say, um, I'm staying home tonight. And the father will say, oh, really? and a train will race past, and a neighbor will knock on the door and say, how are you? And it goes on like that for a couple of hours. And when I was young, I thought, who wants to watch two hours of nothing happening? And then after being in Japan, I realized the daughter saying she's in for dinner means really she's sacrificing her whole life to look after her father. And the father saying, is that so, means he hasn't got it. And the neighbor saying, how are you all doing, is an attempt to wake up the father to the, to the fact that, uh, he's depriving his daughter of a future and a marriage by depending on her. And the train wishing past is taking the son off to a city where he'll never see his father again. So all the passion and intensity of human experience is there, but all pushed under the surface and very subtle and really in the spaces between words. So this goes back to your earlier question. Um, as, as a creator, um, I try to learn um, that most of life takes place between the things that we say and between the big skyscraper dramas of our lives. And I think Japan is more attuned to the small print and the invisible ink than any culture I've met. So this doesn't speak specifically to Japanese crafts, but I think it informs every craft that the visitor appreciates and is about that larger um, sense of everything being alive in Japan. It took me a long time after I got there to realize that my Japanese wife will tell me, for example, when she was a little girl uh, and she was getting angry, she'd punch the table. And her father would say, no, you must apologize to the table because punching the table is like punching your brother. That table has a heart, it has a spirit and everything around us, the, the mug, the glass of water, it's all alive. Uh, and the fact that it's all alive is exactly why people bring such care and reverence to the things around them because we think of them as inanimate but i think in japan nothing is inanimate and everything about crafts has to do with the fact that a pot um, a vase a brush is alive thank you for that beautiful perspective Peter. that was wonderful um for those of you who are uh, familiar with those whose work uh, so one of our attendees has mentioned on the chat that the bfi has a season of his films currently online so if that's whetted your appetite then do check that out um simon can i ask you a, a similar question what is it that draws you to japanese craft i suppose my initial attraction to japan was 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 through calligraphy my, my father was a calligrapher in, in, in this country, in, in, in Britain, and, and so I was brought up with the smell of ink, I suppose, at, at home, and, and, and something which I pursued in Japan the first time I, I, I visited, really. But what I discovered there, and I think what, what, what Pico very, very eloquently pointed out, is the idea of the space, the, the bits in between, uh, and the appreciation of, of, of that space. Um, whether it be something like calligraphy, which is two-dimensional, or you know, be it, be it dance or music, whereby it's it's the spaces in between which are the most important parts, in a way that 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 connect it all together. And I, I find 
I find that the attention to detail that Pico uh, mentioned earlier, even in a convenience store, for example, uh, all quite exquisite in Japan. And I, I, I've been somewhat spoiled, I would say, having lived in Japan to, to come to London and, and all the time. And, and this, this attention to detail is something which, which, which I hope Japan House can, can try and bring to, 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 to the experience for those who, who enter it. And, and, to, and just to show just how, how important it is uh, for life in Japan. Thank you. Thank you for another beautiful, insightful answer. Thank you so much. Um, Matt, I'm afraid I'm going to ask you a really cold and um, practical question. <laughs> All those incredibly lyrical answers. Um, but I wanted to quickly ask, do you think, I think that people might have a perception that a trip to Japan to experience the craft and culture might be a, a, an expensive option, a, a difficult option. Do you think that's true? Are there ways to do it where, that make it easier? Yes, certainly. Um, I think, yeah, you're very right. There's, there's a perception of Japan as being um, an expensive destination. And um, I mean, really, I, the way I see it is it's, it, it's really varies. It kind of depends what kind of traveler you are. Um, if you like luxury things that are going to cost a lot of money, um, then um, and you are in that kind of bracket. Then, um, then you can spend a lot of money in Japan. Um, but if you're not, then there's, you know, there's a wealth of experiences there to be had too. And I think maybe kind of actually the, the very eloquent um, pieces that we've just heard from Aiko and uh, from Pico, sorry, and um, Simon um, kind of underscore this, but there's so much inherently in Japan and Japanese culture and almost like the, the people watching aspect um, <laughs> um, that is, is so enriching culturally and um and so interesting that i think you know there's a lot that you don't have to splash out on in, in in order to be able to enjoy japanese culture and um and you know that doesn't even speak to the kind of experiences that are on offer um that generally don't tend to come at, at you know a, a large cost um especially in more rural areas you know where people are essentially doing it um a lot of the time because because of the passion more than anything and they're excited to have someone um, that they can experience it with or you know um, kind of teach about kind of their, their history their tradition where they're coming um, at their craft from um, so I think I think the combination of those factors means that price definitely doesn't have to be um, prohibitive for someone looking to do a trip to Japan um, maybe the one key piece of information is, is I guess that Japan is is highly seasonal um, so obviously around kind of your boom times so your, your April sort of spring times around cherry blossom tends to get very busy so the prices go up accordingly um, but there are other fantastic seasons in Japan autumn is, is another one but I think winter probably is is my favorite and most underrated season um, a the costs especially with when it comes to flights tend to be a little bit cheaper um, more stable weather um, and also beautiful landscapes and again you know all those craft trad traditions actually were very much mired or kind of blossomed under um under those those uh, kind of meteorological conditions people couldn't leave their house um, so you're experiencing them very much kind of in the flesh as they were as they were born um, so yeah i would say those are probably my my key sort of uh, pieces of advice when it comes to, to, to cost. Thank you. Thank you so much. Matt. I hope that helps some people who are watching plan their trips. Um, I Unbelievably, the time has really whipped along and it's nearly quarter to seven. So I'm going to open it up to questions from our audience. We've got lots and lots, so I'll get through as many as we can. Um, so we've got a question from Lily and she says, I know Japan has many beautiful traditional crafts, but it seems not so many young people are taking up craft as a career nowadays. Do you think some traditional crafts are starting to die out? What can we do to protect the crafts of Japan? for the future. Who, um, Simon, should I perhaps okay. address that to you? I'll go back to um, maybe the, the metal working in Tsubame Sanjo as an example of one uh, gentleman, uh, Mizo Uchi-san, who uh, creates uh, Japanese razors uh, and for, for shaving your head. So of course now, in, during the Edo period, this was a common feature for, for, for Japanese men to, to shave their heads, but it, it's, not, it's not necessary now. So the, the art of making these extraordinarily finely sharp razors is, 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 is disappearing from various regions. And he was the last one left in, in Savannah Sanjo and he had no uh, apprentice to take over. And I exhibited some of his work 
um, the process here in Japan House. And whenever I told the story that Mizuchi-san is the last one, he's 80 years old and he hasn't got an apprentice, you know, people's eyes would well up with tears. It's, it's such a moving. But, but in a way, my feeling is then, but is that such a bad thing? Does that really matter? It, it, in a way, it sounds maybe sound quite harsh, but it's all to do with functionality. I think this idea that that what Hitomi was talking about earlier on, the functionality and the interest and the functionality of ceramics is why ceramics can endure. Um, I mean, ultimately, a razor can endure even in 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 the form that it takes with Mizuuchi san. Um, to cut a very long story short, after our exhibition and the attention that it 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 garnered. Um, he does now have an apprentice and a boy who left high school in, in, in Tsubame Sanjo decided that he wanted to be able to go and learn how to make wadami sori, these, 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 these little razors, extraordinarily sharp. Wow. Three little razors. That's so, a delightfully happy ending, Simon. That's lovely. <laughs> so 18 year olds are doing it. They're doing it. <laughs> and, and, and voluntarily and wanting to. And I think the exposure of that internationally, I think is an important part of it as well. Hey, Tommy, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's true that, that we need to protect these crafts? Yes, totally agree with Simon. And I think that, the, uh, of course, these young generations, the uh, craft is the process itself is art. And when once they master technique and they can show how they make it and the, the in front of them people can try it. And the, these craft people can get a motivation. And the, somehow uh, I think that the, we can connect to the promotion of the, uh, the craft itself. Too. So I think that we should give uh, this young generation craft people more opportunity to get out to Japan, show the process, and they meet their customers. And I think that would be a very uh, good way to promote uh, the apprenticeship uh, in Japan. Thank you so much. Um, let's go to another question. So I've got a question from Raji. Uh, is Japanese painting considered a craft or an art? <laughs> I'm also very interested in the manufacture of traditional brushes and ink sticks. Is it possible to have cultural experiences related to these? Who can I open this out to? I'm reluctant to go, Simon, tell us again about the difference between craft and art. Um, but I, I, won't, like... I won't go into that, but I'll, I'll point to Pico and say, of course, in Nara, uh, Nara is very famous for its brush making. Mm. Um, uh, it's one of, of Nara's crafts, actually. Um, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> If one visits Nara, you, can you see the brushes being made? Is it possible to go and experience that? That I don't know, actually. But I do know, I mean, I suppose each, each region or each area of Japan will have somewhere which shows off its local crafts, its local specialities. And there is in Nara, in the city, there is a, a prefectural uh, centre showing, showing crafts of, of, of Nara and... and brushes are particular to Nara, that much I do know, along with uh, another a particular form of ceramics. I'm trying to think of painting. Um, I think the 19th century uh, and the Meiji Restoration and people like uh, the American art historian Fenelosa did a lot of mischief with, 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 with categorizing Japan and its arts and the division between art and craft I think is maybe a rather arbitrary line. <laughs> there is another question that's just come in from Jane, uh, which says that art and craft seem to be almost one in Japan. Craft in the UK is seen as lesser or not art. Why do you think Japan treats crafts as art? I mean, perhaps you've addressed that, but do you think there's anything more to that? Me? Why? why me? Or maybe yes. I, yes, well, me. anyone else, please. But if that's Simon, I, I feel that you probably have an answer. <laughs> I think I, I like to see things as skill and that all is an art and, and that those, 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 are, those, those words are the same thing, really, semantically very different. But, but if we start to think of it like that, that, that functionality is an important part of, of, of craft, as we like to, 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 to say, maybe, but it's an art. But uh, I, I don't like, I, I try to, to, to display what we do at Japan House by trying to debunk those myths, maybe, and try to blur the lines between, I don't think, I mean, people will make their own decisions, of course, but always try to blur the lines.
Thank you, Simon. Pico, how do you feel? Is, is literature treated particularly different in Japan to, say, America or the UK? Uh, that's a very good question. And not to my knowledge, one of the inspiring things about Japan is you go into a bookshop and everybody's reading. They seem to be devouring entire books in the aisles of bookshops. Um, on the trains, much less so than when I arrived 30 years ago. The screen has eclipsed the book a little. But um, literature has a great tradition and one of the characteristic graces of Japan is that it's so contemporary. I grew up on Mishima, Tanazaki and Kawabata, but now Haruki Murakami and the ones who are younger than he are the most cutting edge fiction writers in the world in many ways and catch something about global suburbia. Um, and just while I think of it before I <coughs> uh, pass this back to you, I loved what Matt was saying and whenever my friends ask me about expensiveness, <clears throat> I'm traveling the world on dollars and every year I go to England and when I go to England I'd say it's twice as expensive as Japan. Uh, and one of the things that I always recommend to my friends when they go to Japan, many restaurants, for example, have teishoku, which is lunch sets, where you can get a three course exquisite meal for maybe six pounds. And of course, there's no tipping, there's no tax, and you almost feel embarrassed that you're eating so well for so little. And the other rule that I found in Japan is it's almost impossible to get a bad meal whether it's a French or an Italian or an Indian or a Vietnamese or, of course, a Japanese meal. Um, the level of cleanliness, <coughs> uh, efficiency, um, service, and taste is beyond almost anything. So, um, and the other small travel tip I give to my friends is to get a Japan Rail Pass because taking lots and lots of train trips can add up, but that pass that allows you unlimited travel for seven, 14, or 21 days means that even that becomes very cheap. So sorry, that taking us away from crafts, but as an encouragement to go to Japan, anyone who's hesitant, please don't be. Food and craft, I think, is good. Food craft, absolutely. <laughs> That's my favourite kind of craft. <laughs> Um, another quite specific uh, craft question here from Marion. Uh, she says, where could I find Japanese embroidery workshops in Japan? Mm. Does she, anyone know? <laughs> she, she, well, I'm going to say probably Kyoto decides that it's going to be the best of that, I would suspect. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> she, she, nah. um, I mean, I, I, I don't know, Pico, I'm going to ask you as well. When you, when you get to something like Nishijin Ori, so the, 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 the weaving techniques in Kyoto are very highly skilled weaving techniques, mostly of things like obi. Obi, the, the belt of a kimono, um, are the things that spring to mind when, we think, when I think of embroidery. And, and they, I, I, I'm, I, I would suggest that I think Kyoto would probably have, in conjunction with the Nishijin Ori, community some people who do that i don't know actually i know that um in the sort of sort of along those same kimono lines um talking about sort of textiles and um, specifically kind of in the very north and the very south um of japan where you have kind of more indigenous communities that weren't necessarily from the same ethnic group originally of uh, as mainland japanese mm -hmm. um, so you have the ainu in the north and um and the, the ryukyu um, down the south in okinawa um, and they have lots of traditional textiles there. So you have the bingata, which is kind of like a kimono, but um, very much <clears> very <throat> colourful, very intricately embroidered. Um, some people might even say gaudy. Um, but um, <laughs> but uh, printed, yeah. Yes, and I and I know that there are um, embroidery workshops um, in um, Naha uh, in Okinawa, um, mm -hmm. just around Shuri Castle. And equally in the north, um, the Ainu kind of side of things, and there's the Atis, which is kind of the, a, another traditional um, Ainu garb. Um, and they've just opened a center called Upopoi, which is um, <laughs> U-P-O-P-O-Y. And I know that they worked with um, which <coughs> on some things recently as well. Um, and they do offer classes in terms of embroidery and um, give an introduction to the symbolism around the embroidery of, of the Atis as well. Um, so there are those kind of cultural centres, certainly. That gives you sort of a, a top, middle and bottom if you go Hokkaido, Kyoto, Okinawa. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. I've forgotten about the, um, the Ainu embroidery workshops we did at Japan House right at the beginning of the year before, before lockdown. Yes, of course. There, there, there is, with, with Ainu cultures, there is very much a gender divide 
traditionally speaking, between <coughs> men and women, and women would, would, would look after textiles, and embroidery is an important part of that, it's true. Yes, thank you, Matt, for reminding me. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Anna, who says, hello from Glasgow, oh, the motherland, hello. Um, how easy is it to find crafts, artists, residency programmes in Japan? She's a wood turner and would like to learn more about the tradition of wood turning and kokeshi in Japan by immersing myself in culture and tradition. Are there any good platforms to research residences that anyone could recommend? So for professional artists, does anyone have any recommendations? Kokeshi, mm, that's quite, I'm, I'm not sure. Ceramics is your is the, is the area where residences do do abound. I mean, one I would say Mashko, for example, Mashko, which is famous for its uh, the relationship of between Hamada Shoji and Bernard Leach of the St Ives pottery. Um, Mashko is very is very is very proud of its really quite recent tradition of 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 ceramics, and they do have they do have a residency. Uh, a program there. Hmm, Kokeshi, wood turning. I, I'd be interested to find out. Do you know anything? Tohoku, it's very much your area, Matt. I would yes, say. Um, I'm a big Tohoku fan. Anybody who knows me um, will know that that's, that's, my, that's my jam. Um, but um, yes, there's certainly in Aizu, actually, specifically Oku Aizu, so deep Aizu, um, there's a um, residency program. I think it's 10 months that they offer. And you have sort of board and you stay with a local family and they teach you all the the regional sort of crafts there which i think will include um woodcraft as well um obviously focus on some of the other bits like lacquerware and the textiles and the the weaving um but there's certainly that um and and yeah i mean i think there's there is a, a general openness as well i'm not sure if if, if um he told me we'll be able to speak a little bit more um, on that as a as an artist as well, um, relating to that that kind of thing. But um, but yeah, I do know that um, the Fukushima Prefecture and Aizu do have some, and there's the Nishi Aizu International Arts Village, I think, which also has a residency program. Um, that's a bit more open ended. It's more art in general, um, but it does have um, you know does draw on on local crafts quite strongly as well. I think. You tell me, is there anything you'd recommend for artists? Well, the, the, the Takayama is famous for the wood furniture and the, they make a doors with wood. So I wonder whether there'll be some kind of place where she can get a residency. Uh, I think that the, maybe, maybe worth looking at uh, their website or asking uh, the, uh, this, uh, the Wood Furniture Association if it exists, um, I think. There is, there is a Hida Mokurenkai. Yes, maybe they have this uh, kind of residency. Or maybe she can suggest to create the residency for, uh, yeah. for from outside. Mm. Well, Anna, I hope you find somewhere to go and do a residency and lots of other people as well, the crafts um, makers out there. Um, I'm afraid that we've run out of time. I can't really believe it. I've got about a million more questions I want to ask everyone, but unfortunately we are at the end of our time. Um, I just really want to say a huge thank you to our panel who are we're just lovely and wonderful. Um, Hitomi, Pico, Simon and Matthew, thank you so much. Um, thank you to Japan House. I believe Japan House will be reopening in some form fairly soon, so please yes. keep an eye on the website and, and go and visit them because it's an incredible space. If you're in London, please drop in it's incredible um, and of course the GNT have got a presence there so you can also chat to them um, please do check out Hitomi's work which is just wonderful and read all of people's books please <laughs> and uh, thank you everyone and thank you to you to the audience for coming and joining us I hope to see you soon either online or maybe even in person one day soon uh, let me tell you a little bit about an event that we have coming up, a genuine live event, and um, that's not till January. Uh, that's our food festival, the National Geographic Traveller Food Festival from the 16th and 17th of January, and that's at the Old Truman Brewery in London. We'd love to see you there. Tickets at the moment are only £10, so uh, do go to our website and book there. Also, the, lots of you, I think, probably are subscribers to National Geographic Traveller, but if you are not, uh, we've got a great offer on at the moment, three issues for £1, so go to our subscription website there and enter the code that you you can see on the screen and you can get three issues for just one pound um, and of course do check out our website uh, for more information about Japan and many other destinations. Uh, it's the end of our event it's time to say goodbye thank you so much to everyone enjoy the rest of your evening stay safe and stay inspired.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.